Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what's going to happen today. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our town hall meeting. Um, every other year, uh, Bold, along with uh, the BCC, has been able to sponsor a town hall meeting uh, on underage drinking. So my name is Craig Gaspard. I'm the staff director at the Bold Coalition. And we have done prevention. We work on prevention issues, uh, substance abuse, of which alcohol is one of the issues. And uh, we feel it's important to bring attention to the community college uh, community as well. So that's why we're here today. Please help yourself. There's food in the back. There are handouts in the front. And if anyone hasn't already signed in, please do. But today, we want to welcome um, the president, who's going to say a few words. And then we're going to have a production about, uh, about substance abuse. So the Improbable Players, they do um, uh, skits, I want to call them, um, around recovery and around alcohol abuse and substance abuse. And that's going to be following Dr. Spraga. And then we will have a panel discussion, hopefully answering some questions that you may or may not have uh, answered before or want more in depth. So we'll have some panelists uh, to participate after the production. So without any further ado, I want to uh, introduce Dr. Spraga. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Welcome to BCC. Many of you have been here before. I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, but we're very honored to be hosting this event. Uh, it's a great uh, way for us to fulfill our mission to the community. This is something that we're very proud of. Uh, I wanted to quickly acknowledge our uh, school nurse uh, is here, or she was here, Carol Constantine. There she is. You're hiding behind the pole there. Uh, uh, I hope that you would t avail yourself of the wonderful handouts and for informational activities and uh, educational brochures that we have put together. I say we, Carol is wonderful about uh, hosting events uh, in Attleboro and New Bedford, uh, uh, as well as Fall River and uh, Taunton, uh, providing the information that uh, is so valuable for families to know and educate themselves more about the evils of, uh, of substance abuse and uh, uh, un unbelievable harm that it causes not only uh, to the person involved but also to their loved ones and their uh, neighbors and family and whatever it is. So uh, uh, you know, uh, there, there are great ramifications uh, in this matter and this topic and I'm so grateful to STAR uh, and uh, to the Bold Coalition for putting together a number of activities such as this and tonight specifically for STAR. You met Craig and uh, we're going to have a panel and uh, discuss this topic which uh, demands our attention. It's such an um, uh, outrageous um, uh, epidemic. I don't think that's too strong a word uh, for what we see in our society. Uh, and people say, you know, uh, people say to me, uh, some of your students are rowdy, or some of them are, you know, having problems. And uh, what my answer is, yes, and we do what we can about that, but they reflect society. They're, they come to us. We don't, they don't change when they come on our campus. They come that way to our campus. And uh, the civility, uh, outrageous behavior, uh, these are things that uh, all are byproducts, unfortunate byproducts of, uh, of uh, what we see in the, uh, the topic that we have tonight of substance uh, abuse. So I'm going to turn it back to Craig now. Craig mentioned that we're going to have the uh, uh, theater uh, episodes now, and then we'll have a panel after that. Please help yourself with some of the refreshments that are available. Again, welcome to Bristol Community College. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Sprague. Today's program is called Stages. It is presented by the Improbable Players. The Improbable Players are a professional acting group from Boston and are here to present a program about alcohol and other drug abuse. Since 
I will introduce everyone here. There, are, we have someone from the district attorney's office from the Fall River Police Department. Um, Dr. Spraga is still here, and we have uh, a couple of people from our program over at Bold, over at the Star, Co uh, the Bold Coalition uh, from Star. So we're going to set that up, and then uh, hopefully um, after some opening statements. If anyone out there has some questions for us about what is really happening in terms of uh, underage drinking and prescription drug abuse, we'll be able to field some questions uh, then, okay? So just give us a couple minutes for us to assemble up on the stage. Continue to uh, get yourself some food over there. Uh, again, my name, is, my name is Craig Gaspard. I'm the staff director at the uh, Bold Coalition. And I'm just gonna introduce all all of our panelists here tonight. Um, to my immediate for some reason, to my immediate right, because everyone hear me, is uh, the president of Bristol Community College, Dr. Dr. Jack Spraga. Br Bristol, thank you. Bristol Community College has experienced record enrollment growth of more than 75% since Dr. Spraga became president in July of 2000. BCC is among the largest of the 15 community colleges located around the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Expansion of services throughout the college's service area includes satellite location in Taunton, as well as new campuses in New Bedford and Attleboro. Moreover, during his tenure, the BCC Foundation's endowment has risen more than 177%. He works tirelessly to provide affordable access to higher education, and I want to thank him personally because BCC is helping sponsor this event more than just hosting the event. They are actually able to provide uh, to offset some of the costs for having the Im improbable players down. So again, I want to thank BCC and the president for doing that. Uh, to, uh, to Dr. Spraga's right, immediate right, is a, uh, Assistant Attorney uh, Paul Machado. He has served as Chief of the District and Juvenile Court since January 2007. Prior to the District Attorney's Office, Attorney Machado ran a successful private defense practice in Fall River for 20 years. Attorney Machado was the 2004 recipient of the CPCS Thurgood Marshall Award for Outstanding Client Representation. And I'll continue, I'll, I'll just introduce everyone and then we'll come back to Dr. Spraga and, and he can make a, they'll all make little statements about uh, how we are, could be uh, addressing uh, underage drinking and prescription drug abuse uh, in our respective communities. So, and to his immediate right, uh, actually on the, on the far end um, is uh, uh, James Riley, uh, who's a school resource officer. At, uh, at Diamond Vocational Technical School, and he's been uh, on the Fall River Police Department for over 30 years. He has a brother who's also a Fall River Police Officer and another brother who's a Fall River Firefighter. I guess you could say he's a Fall River guy. <laughs> so Officer Riley has been the School Resource Officer at Diamond, and he's worked with Mike Aguiar, who, uh, who I work with quite closely, and the Bold Coalition conducting compliance checks and the Sticker Shock campaign, which is very much a, uh, it's a, it's a message for uh, people who are considering buying alcohol and either giving it or selling it to minors. So that's a very important thing. Mike perhaps can explain that or Officer Riley can explain that in a little more detail. He also teaches internet safety and carries out alcohol abuse prevention activities for the Fall River Police Department. Um, and Mike Aguiar, who has over 20 years, though no, actually, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce community member D. Betancourt. D. just came to the Bold, uh, the Bold Coalition and started doing volunteer work for us. She is a caretaker with Cooperative Productions. She is here to lend experience, strength, and hope due to a tragedy that shattered her family life through substance abuse. And I'm gonna turn that over to her right now because she has something she wants to read to everyone in the audience here. Thanks, Dave, do you wanna, you wanna do that?
Hi, my name is Dee. That better? Okay. Hello, my name is Dee. I want to thank this committee for inviting me to this meeting and letting me tell you a little bit about myself, followed by a special poem that will hopefully make you think and inspire you. First of all, I want to say I have a beautiful 15-year-old daughter and her name is Erica. I also had, yes, I'm saying had, a son, a handsome son, 20 years old, and his name was Mark, who is no longer here with us because unfortunately he was an addict. This has changed me my entire life, but I decided not to just sit in bed and cry and be depressed over it. I decided to take out and spread the word that drugs do kill and there are many organizations and people that can help. Now here's a little bit about Mark. He was an A student, all-star athlete, an altar boy, and a caring, loving kid. But at the age of 13, he started experimenting with marijuana. And marijuana and alcohol was next, and I had no clue until I got my first phone call from the Fall River Police Department saying he was found passed out at Columbus Park. He ended up in the ER getting his stomach pumped. After that, things seemed to be okay for a little while. Until I received my second phone call from his best friend, telling me to get to the hospital because Mark was stabbed in the stomach. All I could do was pray. Fortunately, he pulled through I survived and survived. And this was all due to drugs and money. Once again, things were okay for a while, but I started noticing my son's behaviors. He had a bad attitude. He slept all day, up all night, had no more incentive to play sports, and much more. I offered to take him to detox numerous times, but he refused and would always tell me, Mom, I'm all right. Don't worry about me. But I never stopped worrying because I loved him. Unfortunately, I received my third phone call and final on August 15th. 2007. Again, it was his best friend telling me to get to Rhode Island Hospital because Mark was hurt really bad. When I arrived, I was placed in the family room and a doctor, priest, and a police officer came in to tell me my son had been shot and didn't make it. This is my son. This is all I have left. I was so hysterical, not knowing what to do. I asked, why? Why did he get shot? I was told he was buying Oxycontin and was robbed for his money. My son was addicted to Oxycontin. So if you think drugs don't destroy families and kill, they absolutely do. It's dangerous whether you're taking, buying, or selling them. Now I am a mother who mourns every second of every day for my son to come back home. And I know it will not happen. This is why I'm here tonight, to spread my experience, strength, and hope with all of you, hoping this will give you some guidance and strength to make better decisions and live a safe and happy life. Thank you. Thank you, Dee. Thanks for reading that. Now, now here is a poem I would like for you to listen to in memory of my son, Mark. It's called Pills. I destroy homes, tear families apart, take your children, and that's just the start. I'm more costly than diamonds, more costly than gold. The sorrow I bring is a sight to behold. And if you need me, remember, I'm easily found. I live all around you, in schools and in town. I live with the rich, I live with the poor. I live down the street and maybe next door. My power is awesome, try me, you'll see. But if you do, you may never break free. Just try me once, 
and I might let you go. Try me twice, and I'll own your soul. When I possess you, you'll steal and you'll lie. You do what you have to just to get high. The crimes you'll commit for my narcotic charms will be worth the pleasure you'll feel in my arms. You'll lie to your mother, you'll steal from your dad. When you see their tears, you should feel sad. But you'll forget your morals and how you were raised. I'll be your conscience, I'll teach you my ways. I take kids from parents and parents from kids. I turn people from God and separate from friends. I'll take everything from you, your looks and your pride. I'll be with you always, right by your side. You'll give up everything, your family, your home, your friends, your money, then you'll be alone. I'll take and I'll take till you have nothing more to give. When I'm finished with you, you'll be lucky to live. If you try me, if you try me wand, be warned, this is no game. If given the chance, I'll drive you insane. I'll ravish your body, I'll control your mind. I'll own you completely, your soul will be mine. The nightmare I'll give you while lying in bed, the voices you'll hear from inside your head. The sweats, the shakes, the visions you'll see. I want you to know, these are all a gift from me. But then it's too late and you'll know in, the heart, in your heart that you are mine and we shall not part. You'll regret that you tried me, they always do. But you came to me, not I to you. You knew this would happen many times, you were told. But you, cha you challenged my power and chose to be bold. You could have said no and just walked away. If you could live that day over, now what would you say? I'll be your master, you'll be my slave. I'll even go with you when you go to your grave. Now that you have me, what will you do? Will you try me or not? It's all up to you. I can bring you more misery than words can tell. Come take my hand. Let me lead you to hell. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. To Dee's right is Mike Aguiar. And uh, after I introduce Mike, uh, we'll come back to Dr. Sprague and uh, take some statements about uh, what they're doing in their own communities in terms of underage drinking and prescription drug abuse. So Mike has over 20 years of experience designing and implementing youth development programs around substance abuse prevention. He has worked as the youth program director at Stanley Street Treatment and Resources in Fall River for the past 16 years. His current initiatives at the Bold Coalition include a recent ordinance submitted for review that strengthens the state social host law. And he might want to spend a little bit of time uh, explaining that to everyone here. So um, thank you all for, for participating uh, this evening. And uh, we'll start with Dr. Spraga. Thank you and good evening. What a what a wonderful uh, presentation we've had, uh, and uh, it's really compelling and, and thought provoking. Um, I wanted to just mention quickly some things at Bristol Community College. Uh, <clears throat> we have a very extensive uh, uh, drug and alcohol abuse policy. We have a zero tolerance for uh, any such activity on the campus, including distribution or sale, uh, as well. Uh, we try to enforce it, uh, we don't try, we enforce it very rigorously. Should, uh, should some, some, you know, should uh, trespassers uh, appear. We have a lot, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, we have a lot of people who come to the campus who are not necessarily students or associated with the campus directly. Uh, we are a resource, you can use our computer labs, you can use our library. <coughs> but you must obey and abide by uh, the rules of the college, and uh, particularly in what we're talking about tonight in substance abuse. Uh, 
Um, one of the things that uh, we do, I kind of gave a hint of it in my opening remarks, but Carol Constantine, our health uh, in our health department and others, uh, we participate in workshops. We we uh, collaborate in operations like such as this with Star, with Bold, uh, with the city, with other community organizations. We try to have all of these information packages available for you on the table. I hope you'll stop by uh, the table and pick up some on your way out. Uh, but it's an informational, we're educational institution. We try to educate people on the evils uh, uh, of uh, substance abuse, and sometimes uh, logic doesn't always work, right? And it's hard to persuade people to uh, what's best for them. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, things that we've noticed is that as people come in for counseling, uh, is that um, you know, there is depression, there is anxiety among our students. The students don't perform well academically in the classroom, uh, certainly not up to uh, expectations. Uh, we all know uh, potential is uh, one of those terrible words, right? Uh, you've got to live up to them. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> we have uh, counseling, we have uh, professional references that we can referrals that we can make. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, see the effect in the classroom. And that, that leads to something that we have been uh, very much uh, uh, emphasizing, and that is something called harm reduction. Uh, the uh, AA activity of uh, total abstinence, I mean, that's, that's fine, and it works for many people, and that's wonderful. But harm reduction it, uh, comes about in a little more positive way, where you try to uh, come to uh, an addict or an abuser and a uh, substance abuser and mention what is it that uh, about this abuse, uh, about what you're doing to yourself that gets in the way of what you want to do with your life? Or what is it that's preventing you, uh, maybe at school from getting good grades, but much, uh, much uh, uh, you know, a wider uh, net of activities in your life? And uh, there's, so it's kind of a motivational uh, uh, activity which uh, can work or cannot work. I think, uh, as we found out from our theater players, uh, they knew uh, when they were doing it that it was not the best thing for them or for their loved ones or for their friends. But what, uh, if we can try to persuade uh, them that um, uh, the, the, there is an effect on others that you love, in effect on you, you're not being the person that you could be. So harm reduction is kind of a new twist, or not a new twist, but a, a twist away from just say no or just no abs uh, total abstinence uh, to try to make it in a more positive way. Uh, the brain development, um, uh, sometimes we wish it would be <laughs> in your uh, teenage years or before teenage, but it really doesn't mature until your early 20s in the frontal uh, lobe uh, areas. And uh, that is the seat of uh, your rational judgment, right? And uh, uh, irrational behavior and snap judgments. And it's something that uh, doesn't come to full development. but. On, in, I'm going to use the term, uh, what, uh, people that are not abusing. And that's in your early 20s, mid 20s, that it finally comes to flower, if you will. But with the substance abuse, uh, that is delayed. And uh, it is uh, uh, the, prog the progression, the natural progression, the biological progression, if I could call it that, are uh, uh, interrupted. And uh, and you can see the consequences that we all have. Uh, we all know people that have run into those kind of consequences. So uh, I don't want to go on too much longer, but it's uh, zero policy at uh, at Bristol. We are uh, we uh, must uh, keep available resources and uh, help for people that ask for it. Uh, and uh, you know that that's part of our uh, activity as an education institution in the community. And I'll uh, be glad to answer any questions at a later time about it. Thank you, Dr. Sprague. Um, Paul, Paul Machado. Good evening. The Bristol County District Attorney's Office is responsible for approximately 30,000 new criminal cases per year. I can't tell you the statistics, the exact statistics as how many of those are 
alcohol or drug related, but we know that it's a vast number of those. Not only those that involve crimes such as the possession or distribution of drugs, but crimes that are related to drugs, such as breaking and entering, larcenies, and unfortunately, as Ms. Betancourt has described, uh, the crime involving her son. Um, it is certainly something that we see on a daily basis, and unfortunately, the rehabilitative resources that are available are very limited. Um, but it's interesting. A uh, couple of years ago, a program called Reflections House opened up. And we know that we, as a society, spend a lot of money in incarcerating people. We spend a lot of money in prosecuting people, policing. Um, but we don't, as a society, spend, I think, as much as we should on rehabilitating people. Um, so a couple of years ago, a program called Reflections House opened up. And Reflections House is a long-term addiction facility located in New Bedford. And when that opened up, they contacted the district attorney's office, not just the Bristol district attorney's office, but, but all of the district attorney's offices in the region, to encourage <coughs> us to make referrals to this long-term inpatient program. And, and I was the point person for the Bristol County referrals, and I would review the types of cases that were appropriate for referral to Reflections House. And one of the things that I would do is, um, and, and it's a long-term program, so it's obviously for someone who has a significant, not, not a first offense, but some significant history of offenses who has probably at a certain point come to the conclusion that my, I've got, my addiction is harming my life, I need to make some changes, and I would assess it. And one of the things that I did was I would make sure whenever there was a victim involved that I would contact the victim. And, and I can tell you that I was very nervous in doing that. I have some uh, clients who I thought, based on their record, based on what they would, what I would learn about their history of addiction, that they would be appropriate candidates. But I always told them, well, I have to get the agreement from the victims um, before I will okay the referral. And, and I was very nervous in calling up victims of crimes to say that, you know, instead of sending this person to jail, I want to recommend that we send them to a program. And I've got to say that it was 100%, um, and maybe it's just, it's not a huge number of cases, uh, because unfortunately there are not a whole lot of beds at Reflections House. But it was of the cases that I contacted the victims on, even of very serious cases, 100% of the victims were in agreement that we would send them to a rehabilitation program. Um, and that really was an eye-opener to me. Um, so I think that it is something that we need to do. Um, we need to change our focus or supplement our focus from just incarcerating people. And we certainly want to address this issue, these related issues as early as possible. And I know that we have uh, instituted a diversion program in our juvenile courts. Our, our resources are not great, but there are some great online education programs when we see cases of um, underage drinking, marijuana use. We can very early um, require that as a condition of diversion. I know that, uh, and, and I want one last thing, I know that through Mike, we've been going to the Fall River Police Station and, and um, participating in training on underage drinking. And one of the things, in fact, I'm going to the last one tomorrow morning. And, and one of the things that, one of the messages that we've tried to convey uh, is that the statistics are that underage drinking is serious, it has serious consequences, um, but we also wanted to convey that, you know, if you bring those complaints, if you charge a juvenile with underage drinking, 
we're not going to ruin their life. We're not going to sanction them uh, so that they won't be able to get jobs in the future. We're going to look for alternatives such as diversion so that maybe they get the message. Um, so, um, and that I hope is, um, <clears throat> will work to promote some, instead of just um, avoiding the issue, let's, let's bring some attention to the issue and hopefully do things differently in the future. Um, Dee, I'm very sorry about the loss of your son. I too lost a close family member uh, this summer to um, heroin overdose. Sorry. And I know that uh, my guess is from looking at the audience reaction while you were speaking that there are members of this audience who've also suffered the same types of losses. So I'm very sorry, Dee. Thank you. And I don't even need one, to be honest with you, but uh, again, my name's Mike Agha. I've been working <clears throat> at Star actually 18 years, but um, I wear many hats in the community. One of the things that I work at is underage drinking prevention. Um, all these folks you see here, the district attorney's office, um, Cecilia Porsche from the DA's office, and Carol Constantine, we've been working together for quite a few years now on um, underage drinking prevention, specifically. Uh, the DA's office also has an underage drinking prevention task force that we sit on. Um, so we all work on this together. Actually, Ann, too, I didn't mean to forget you. Ann works on a lot of prevention stuff with us. Uh, so we all get together as a community and try to come up with some kind of solutions to a lot of the things that we have to deal with uh, with our young people. One of the other hats that I wear, I work, work part-time. I'm a real busy guy for the city of Fall River. The city of Fall River has, it's called the Mass Call 2 grant, um, and that's another coalition for uh, opiate overdose prevention. Basically, we have a three-year grant, and there are 14 communities that are funded in the state of Massachusetts, and Fall River has been very fortunate to be one of them. Uh, a few components of that is uh, we, we actually subcontract our outreach, our street outreach, um, to Seven Hills Behavioral Health. And what they do is they actually go to places like the park that Dee described where her son was, and they try to reach these people, get them into treatment, or get some kind of counseling, some kind of help, some kind of assistance, and let them know that there is help out there, there are people out there um, that are willing to help them. Um, we also uh, partially fund Chowton, um, Memorial Hospital, which is South Coast Health Systems and St. Anne's Hospital, we have health advocates in the emergency rooms. And what they do is when people come in to the emergency room, they screen them for substance abuse issues. And they will make appropriate referrals uh, to treatment, counseling, or even inpatient. They may actually keep them there if they feel that's the need. Um, and we're getting some really good uh, information from them folks. Now we have uh, seven days a week, and the hospitals have agreed to pay for these people. So th that's kind of a good thing that's come out of this. And the other thing we do is uh, overdose prevention with people who are in treatment for uh, opiate abuse. So that's currently at STAR and Habit Opco, which is a methadone clinic. Um, and we train folks to train people in treatment that if they do relapse and go back out there, hopefully they don't, but the reality is a lot of them do, um, they can bring people back basically from an overdose if they participate in the NACAN program, which I'm going to get into in a minute. But even Officer Riley, I mean, if we look at the paper every single day, there's robberies in the paper like I've never seen before in my life. I'll guarantee you this is all coming out of the Oxycontins, the heroin, and it's the opiates. It's, it's taken off huge. I remember 10, maybe 10 years ago, heroin in the city of Fall River was, what, $10? $10. You remember this little cycle we went through? It was like $10 a bag. We had high school kids doing heroin like 30 bags a day. And these are 15-year-olds. And I had them coming into my office. It was incredible. Because they were able at that time they weren't sticking needles in their arms, so they were sniffing it and figuring, I'm not a heroin addict, I'm not a junkie, because that's not how I'm doing it. Well, they ended up being junkies, and that's, that's what the reality was. Fortunately, that didn't last long. That lasted about a year and a half. Well, now we're in a different cycle. We're in the, the clean drugs, is the way they view them. Oxycontins, uh, oxycodones, we get this in a prescription from a pharmacist, 
prescribed by a doctor so they're clean. They're not cut with street drugs. Well, the same thing's happening again. We're ending up with the same problems we had with the heroin years ago. What happens when they don't have the extreme amount of money that it's going to cost to maintain a habit, I mean, one pill can be $60, $50. If they don't have that money, they switch over to heroin because it's cheaper. So they're going to find something to do somehow. Um, where is all this coming from? It's coming from doctors. Look at the paper last week. There was a doctor for over prescribing. I know when I was young, if there was a doctor giving out prescriptions, everybody knew. They all knew. They would line up to go to that doctor. I mean, that's that's still happening now. Doctors are over prescribing. They're prescribing to people that don't shouldn't even have them. Um, we also have those pain clinics down in Florida. I'm sure most people know about. And they just go down there, they shop around from clinic to clinic to clinic, and they bring them all back here and they put them out on the streets. Um, one, of the, one of the best things that we can all do is to be aware of it. Be aware of your friends. I had a young person in my office the other day that wasn't there for substance abuse, but I could tell that person was on something because the person was itching their face the whole time. And that's one of the, the signs of uh, using some of these medications. They, or I should say drugs, uh, they, they do make you kind of itch. And I just want to give you folks some uh, things to look for, especially with young people. Look at your friends and your family and, and see if you see some things like the grades are declining uh, drastically, uh, the change in personality or irritable. All teenagers are irritable. We know that. <laughs> it's drastic, though. Um, changes in hygiene or appearance. Again, you you know, working with young people, uh, they do change from from time to time. But extreme stuff. They're not showering. High school and middle school kids, they always have to look the same. They have to look right. Well, they don't go out of the house. If that's changing, there's something going on there. You need to look for it. You look for a change in their sleep patterns. Are they sleeping at unusual times? Are they sleeping more? Teenagers love to sleep. We know that, too. Different, different patterns. They're spending time sleeping where they normally wouldn't have. Um, are they selling possessions? All of a sudden, the Xbox is gone. The PlayStation is gone. Uh, I thought I had $20 in my wallet. Maybe I missed, I spent it. I didn't know I did. If money's missing, there's another sign you got to look for. Uh, lost of interest in past activities they used to enjoy. They don't want to go and play football or hockey or whatever they enjoyed in the past. They don't have an interest in that anymore because the drug is what they're interested in, and that's it. Um, or they have, they're hanging with new friends, new, older, older friends, a new crowd, people you didn't know. Or they isolate themselves a lot. Teenagers tend to do that sometimes too. But they're in the bathroom a lot, they're in the bedroom a lot, and they're not sitting with you. They're not sitting with you at the dinner table, they're not watching TV with you. And also, look out for medications that's missing in your home. If there are medications missing in your home, it's up to you to monitor those and keep track of how many you think you should have. And if you have young people in your house, it may not be your, your child, it could be their friend. Um, so you, you'd be better off buying a lockbox and locking those things up. And keep count of them and make sure you know where they are, secure them. Um, also, don't leave them around if you don't need them. Get rid of them. We have a drug take back at the First Congregational Church. It's a good time to throw that ad in there. First Congregational Church on Rock Street on April 29th from 10 to 2. And the first, how many people get a $10 stop and shop card or something? 100. First 100 people get a stop and shop card. Uh, and we do this twice a year, so it's a good time to get rid of your medications. Um, we have flyers on the table. And there are flyers on the table that you can grab on your way out. I just, I, I know that we're kind of running late, and I just want to hit a couple real quick things that I think will be helpful. One of the things that we do have, uh, the City of Fall River is fortunate to have a Narcan site, and Seven Hills Behavioral Health has a drop-in center on Main Street, 310 South Main Street, and there's these little cards on the table, and it has the hours of operation. What you can do is go there and they will teach you how to recognize an overdose or when a person is overdosing and how to take the appropriate steps to prevent that, them from dying, basically. And they also will give you Narcan, which is a nasal spray. It's an opiate blocker that you spray half in one nostril, half in the other, and you can take it with you. You can legally have it in the state of Massachusetts and you can't get arrested for it. There's a sticker right on the box 
Um, that tells them, tells the police they can't arrest you for this. Um, yeah, and you can be trained. They're open Monday through Friday at certain hours. You sit with a counselor, they teach you all this stuff, they give you the knock and you take it home. There was a woman that at a meeting I was at recently, a statewide meeting, she had knock in every room in her house because she was so afraid of her kid overdosing. And he ended up overdosing on the front lawn, turned blue. She ran out there with the knock in and brought him back to life. So that was a good story. I also had a friend that was in recovery. He's actually a, a millionaire these days, but he had gone to every treatment center in the world for heroin. And he told me when he was running a painting contracting business, him and his uh, workers used to try to beat each other in the apartment because they wanted to use the bathroom first to see what was in the medicine cabinet. So don't leave stuff in your medicine cabinet you don't need. The other thing I have here is, wow, that gets really loud. The treatment guide, they're on the table also. This is, has a lot of resources about where you can get help. Um, you don't have to look in the yellow pages. Nobody uses phone books anymore anyway. But this has treatment facilities. You have outpatient counseling. You have suboxone programs. There is no guarantee to get someone into treatment. Treatment dollars are getting cut all the time. And it's getting harder and harder to get people into treatment, as anyone who's had to do it will know. Um, but this is a place to start. When I was a case manager years ago, I had a, a young lady came in and she had a heroin problem and she had all her possessions in a trash bag. That's everything she owned in the world. On a Friday she came in, I couldn't get her into treatment. She found a place to stay for the weekend. She overdosed and died over the weekend. So I never got her in treatment on Monday. And that's something that you always stay, it stays with you. Um, so treatment is the best option. Even if you get them in outpatient counseling where they see a counselor until you can get them inpatient. Um, this is a good resource for you. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Want to pass the mic down to Officer Oh, yeah. And, uh, there you go, Jim. We can, we can stay Sorry. a few extra minutes, hopefully. I'll uh, be quick. We have the room until 7.30, <laughs> so if anyone wants to stay, uh, you're Officer Riley, and if anyone wants to ask any questions, I want to encourage you to do that. Okay? Good evening. My name's Officer Riley. Um, the Four River Police Department has two pro, actually they're not programs, but what we've done in the last several years, um, we concentrated on underage drinking. As everybody knows, the um, money situation in the city of Fall River has been pretty bad lately, so we were able to get some grants to help us out with these uh, particular um, situations that we deal with. The first, the first one we do is what we call the party patrol. What we do is we have officers out there that go around to selected areas, parks, um, looking for underage drinking. Okay. We uh, target parks uh, in the city, and we're usually pretty reliable on getting information. And believe it or not, most of our information comes from Facebook. Um, if we go on a Facebook site, the, the uh, you always brags about where the big party is going to be. And that's one of the things that we use um, doing that. And just, just for a quick example, and I'll be quick, um, between April 1st, 2011, to this date, we have had 45 arrests and summonses of underage drinking um, through that time. And I have the whole list right here. Um, what happens after we make the arrest or summons, they're referred to um, the district attorney's office and Mr. Machado's office takes it from there. The other thing that I, we do in the city of Fall River, and I do this with Mike Gaggia, I've been doing it for several years. What we do, I used to call it the sting, but unfortunately, uh, Mr. Aggia says we have to call it compliance checks. So what we do is I have underage operatives who work with me, usually a student who wants to get into the criminal justice field um, from BCC or other colleges, and what we do is we send them into the liquor stores here in the city of Fall River and see if they're served. And we've been doing that for a couple of years. And what happens if they are served, immediately that would go into the store and they'll be summoned in front of the licensing board, which they could uh, have a fine or even lose their license. Um, but uh, Mr. Aguiar was um, a great help in this, uh, doing the compliance checks. Um, and we work with the Fall River Licensing Board. And we also have a sticker shock. I don't know if Mike talked about that. We have some stickers made up, they're put on cases of beer inside liquor stores to say it is a crime to purchase beer for an underage person. It is a crime. Um, we have, um, liquor stores have let us in, 
to these stores. We've had liquor stores who resisted us on going in, but we have taken care of that situation. Um, and just on a, another note, I'm a school resource officer at Diamond Volk High School. I've been up there about 10 years. And the next three months is the worst time for the high schools because what do we deal with? Proms. Proms, and unfortunately, with proms comes alcohol. At Diamond, what I do is I have what we call a mock drunk driving crash. And it's pretty interesting. I have the juniors and seniors come out to the back of the school. We have a wrecked car and we actually have students who are the actors. And what happens, um, we have the car um, turned over or whatever and uh, students are inside the car. We have makeup, blood, everything like that. And all, this, all the students watch what's going on. And, the biggest part of this is, is just get out the education. Let them, know, let them know the problems they could have if something happens. But with this happening, we also have, which really, um, you, you have to see the eyes of these students, is we have actually a person who has died in the accident laying on the ground. We actually have the hearse come in um, with the uh, funeral home and put that person in a body bag and take them away. It's, it's something to see. Um, and we usually have that every two years. We cover the juniors and seniors, and this year we'll, we'll be covering it. This year we're going to be having that. And I'll be taking any questions from anybody on any related matters through the Fall River Police Department. Thank you. Please, let's have a little round of applause for everybody. Anyone wanted to ask a question and felt that anyone up here uh, on the panel could answer that question, please don't hesitate. I think we have a Okay, great. I think we can call anybody. A couple questions? I know we all want to go. Yes. Thanks, thanks for staying. Uh, this is a question for uh, Officer Riley. Yes, sir. Um, have you personally been to any drunk driving crashes? Have you personally been called to? I'm, uh, great question. Um, and what I'm going to explain to you it actually happened to me. Probably around maybe 20 years ago, I was on routine patrol. This was my area, BCC, the north end of Fall River. Um, and I was on patrol, and I got a call of an auto pedestrian accident down on North Main Street in the city of Fall River. So the cross street, they gave the cross street. I said, boy, that's, that's right where I live. So. What happened is I went, went down to the uh, accident site. As I got down there, uh, I saw a body lying in the middle of the road. It's just been struck by a vehicle. Nobody else in sight, the vehicle had taken off. Um, so obviously I, I got out of my car, and there was a lot of people already milling around. This was like probably around 7.30 in the evening. Um, and basically I went up to the uh, person and to see if they were alive or not, and there was a person standing next to me, and he said, my first name's Jim. He says, Jim, that's your Uncle Leo laying there. And at that point, I looked down, and it was my Uncle Leo missing a leg. And what happened was that from that point on, we had no idea where that vehicle, after we struck him, we measured the speed about 100 miles an hour, struck him, and killed him and his dog. He was walking his dog. For some unknown reason, the driver of that vehicle pulled up to a area of Fall River we call Dave's Beach. And he, one of my friends who was a police officer, decided to go down that area just to check. And when he went down there, he saw a gentleman who was about to burn his car. And obviously it was a car that hit my uncle. And in fact, my uncle's uh, pants legs, not the, the uh, pants himself, was still embedded in front of the car. So with that said, that gentleman uh, went to trial, convicted, he served manslaughter charges on that. Um, but that's. I've seen that and I've seen many. I've seen um, off duty. It's, it's not something good you want to see. And I always tell that story to the um, students at Diamond every year. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> I wanted to ask anyone on the panel if they think the shows such as Intervention and Dr. Drew glamorize the use of drugs or are they informative? <laughs> I, I think they have some valuable stuff to offer, uh, intervention more so than Dr. Drew, and I've watched them both. But um, uh, 
Actually, I was at a town hall meeting where one of the interventionists was on the panel in uh, Foxborough probably about four years ago, and he was really good. I mean, I, I, I actually enjoyed listening to him. Um, but Dr. Drew, I think, you know, with the stars and all that kind of stuff, which by the way, you know, Jeff Conway from Taxi was uh, addicted to opiates and ended up dying, I think, this past year. Um, but the, the one thing that, that I got out of that town hall meeting was he said, I forget, the five, 500 something youth die every single week from um, alcohol related accidents or whatever. And he said, and nobody is upset about it. But if a plane full of teenagers crashed every week and they all died, we'd all be upset. Mm -hmm. And I always like that because it really puts it in perspective because it's so scattered around that people don't realize you know, how many people are being affected. Mm -hmm. But getting back to your question specifically, me personally, I, I would go with the intervention, but Dr. Drew I think is a little more Hollywood type mm -hmm. thing. But I can't even watch intervention anymore either. I just, personally. Anybody else? Thank you. Oh, here you go. Susan? Okay. I just, uh, you know, we see so much of alcohol uh, commercials with the association with sports and uh, the wonderful, we all watch the commercials. We can't wait for the Super Bowl commercials and they're all Budweiser, I think. And uh, how, do small groups and community groups like us, uh, what can we do to prevent, to present our image when there's so much glamorization of, uh, of the industry of drinking? Is that me again? <laughs> <laughs> Is that original? Me again? You can actually join our coalition. We have an underage drinking coalition and we meet the third Wednesday of every month at 3 o'clock at Stanley Street Treatment and Resources, and that's what we do. Um, advertising, I look forward to the Super Bowl commercials. I think they're pretty good sometimes. Um, and we all have to understand what we're here for is underage drinking prevention, not adults. Um, and that's a whole different issue. It's not any different, but it's not something that we focus on. Um, and alcohol advertising is really a sticky point for us to try to attack because there are uh, you know, certain, uh, what do you call them? I can't think of the word. But anyway, legally they have a right to advertise and we can't stop them. You know, there's, there's like freedom of speech amendments and all that kind of stuff that uh, advertising, we've been warned by our state um, attorneys that work with us that advertising might be something we want to stay away from. Um, so we kind of are. I just have uh, one. Even though they're going after it on the tee, they're getting the average. Susan, let me, just, let me just say something. If, Mike, are you done? Um, so, some places like colleges actually can make a decision if they do advertisement to not carry advertisements, certain sure. kinds of advertising for alcohol, for instance. So, you can, you can make a decision, uh, and I'm not saying that BCC even runs advertisement. I don't know whether they do or they don't. But in some situations, you can decide not to, not to put certain advertisement in a publication if you think that publication could be read by a predominantly, you know, underage population. In, in a public sense. place. In a public place. Yeah, right. I think there was a law uh, to limit the, uh, or ban uh, alcohol advertisement on state property. Uh, do, you, do you know where that, that legislation is at, Mike? I, I don't know where it's at, but they're still working on trying to ban it off, off the T in Boston, too. Right. They specifically target the ones that go to the schools, and it's all over the place. And I know I was at Providence College recently, and there's no advertising allowed on campus. But as soon as you step off campus, there's banners, Budweiser banners hanging off porches of dorms and not on the campus though, the off-campus housing. Uh, they sponsor a lot of stuff out there in the colleges. So, but fortunately here that's not the case because no one lives here, so. I just Do you have one more brief question? More uh, sure. for Dr. Sprager. Uh, in the class, classrooms, if a professor notices a student's just not with it and has some uh, suspicions that there might, are they encouraged to uh, take some action and talk to them individually and, and uh, 
for the yes, for the yes, yes. We have a uh, confidential referral system where the in instructor might uh, pass along the name or urge the student to uh, go to this office and uh, uh, try to get the help that uh, he or she needs. Uh, and it's the same with disruptive behavior, uh, to, whether it's substance related or not. Uh, we have referrals, and as I mentioned, we have counselors uh, either on the site or uh, on referral uh, for some help. We don't get into heavy duty counseling, uh, uh, and but we have the referral system uh, to move the move the uh, student uh, uh, along that pathway. I think we'll probably call it there. Thanks everyone for coming. I want to thank the panelists again for participating and giving their time. And we have lots of food in the back, so, and then flyers on the right-hand side. Uh, thanks again. It was uh, our pleasure to do this. Thank you.